Um, but I'm great delight that our first speaker is here yet again. I think it's the fourth time that we've had uh, Vice President mm -hmm. Crow speak. She's consistently, I think, shown herself to be a supporter of openness, both as the Competition Commissioner earlier and now, of course, the Commissioner in charge of the Digital Agenda. And that's an area that really is fundamental to everyone in this room about how that goes forward. So I'm delighted she's here again to hear her views on innovation. Please welcome Vice President Crowes. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be back. And uh, normally spoken, uh, the advice is uh, don't go back for uh, give another uh, forum uh, an opportunity. But to be quite open to you, in this case, uh, I took the lead and I said we should go back to the Open Forum Europe and uh, deliver a couple of remarks, so to say. And normally spoken, uh, I'm not that known for being modest, but in this case, with the title, I indeed proved to be a bit modest and just saying, how can Europe compete? Let's start with the verb compete and then take the leadership, but first uh, start. For we are all aware that our world is changing fast. 20 years ago, a uh, few had heard of the internet and today it is used by two to three billion worldwide. So it is a trillion euro marketplace. It's the platform for innovation, transforming every sector from healthcare to transport, energy, name it. And these days it's hard to predict how the world will look in a few months, let alone years. There's so much potential in the path ahead. Those changes are thanks to research and innovation in new technologies, new products, new business models. But those changes also enable a new kind of research and innovation, open, agile, collaborative, and innovation using new forums <clears throat> like online collective platforms, new resources like open data, new techniques like data mining. And the EU has long supported research and innovation, and rightly so, by the way. It is the best way to invest in future growth. And it delivers better when we do it together, when we pull our resources for economics of scale and let the benefits spill over across borders. Our investment has already delivered great things. And that support will continue for the seven years of Horizon 2020 from 2014 to 2020. We have proposed 80 billion euros of investment, of which around one-fifth for ICT. Across the spectrum, ladies and gentlemen, from pure research to pure innovation and all the bits in between, that support should continue. But it also needs to change, because the tools that supported ICT in yesterday's world won't work in tomorrow's. And the pace of change, the capacity for new disruptive ideas, is simply too great. We must update our policies and practices for the digital world. Better innovation needs new ideas, more agile support, and a culture where it's okay to take risks. If you are an entrepreneur and you don't take a risk, you don't innovate, it's that simple. It's time that this philosophy also spread more to the public bodies who support innovation. There are a number of things we need to do. Already we have set out how we will make Horizon 2020 easier to use with a simpler architecture, more streamlined funding schemes, and the lowest possible administrative burden. But we need to go further. We need to give our research and innovation the three Cs, more challenging, more coherent, and better boosting competitiveness. Number one, remember that great innovation isn't about keeping the status quo. It is about challenging it. It's radical, it's disruptive, and sometimes no linear, especially for emerging 
technologies. So let's make space for that in Horizon 2020. And here's what I want to do. I want to try our support for truly open, disruptive innovation in ICT, allocating perhaps 5% of funds to create an open, agile, responsive funding instrument, starting an experiment to support creativity and innovation. And I also want to inspire innovators with inducement prizes for solutions to major technical and societal challenges, however disruptive. And I want to show procurement agencies across Europe the benefits of buying innovative technologies, even before they hit the market, and show them how they can save taxpayers money and stimulate a new generation of technology leaders at the same time. And most of all, I want us to be more challenging and responsive in how we manage projects. There is nothing wrong with taking a risk. But if a project turns out not to work as intended, funders should be able to stop it and free up innovators for other challenges. Equally, if a project exceeds expectations, if it works well, great. Then we should prioritize it, for example, supporting private fundraising for it and exploiting its results faster. Second, innovation needs to be coherent. At the moment, we work within our own safe little boxes, researching in separate subject silos or funding from separate pots of money. We still too often see policy issues as distinct islands, societal challenges as unrelated to industrial or academic ones. And many <coughs> actors as beneficiaries are quite happy staying in their silo, too comfortable to risk breaking out of them. But that isn't right. The areas we are working in aren't distinct and separate. They are inherently linked, different parts of the same puzzle. A particular research field doesn't belong to just one objective. Often it serves many. Take an area like smart cities. They can help climate change, transport, energy, social inclusion, and give European industry a global boost. Or take robotics, with applications from healthcare to industry to emerging technology. Too often these days, ladies and gentlemen, we will look at a proposal that meets several objectives. But we have to turn it down, because <clears throat> we can't figure out which box to fit it into. So let's break down these artificial walls Let's have more open calls and schemes cutting across challenges. And that can build on existing work, like the Embedded Systems Platform from Artemis or the Europe uh, Robotics Platform. And let's bring other barriers too, down to Look at areas like micro and nano electronics. If we want to succeed there, we need to pull down the walls between our innovation policy and our industrial policy, bringing together public and private funds for large strategic projects to develop this key enabling technology, but also supporting pilots to help industry cross the gap between successful research and actual markets, the so-called valley of death. Only then, could we make Europe an innovation powerhouse and create something as an Airbus of chips? And we will look beyond that to the coherence of our policy framework. It's no use supporting innovation with one hand if we strangle it with the other. For example, current copyright restrictions often prevent innovations like data and text mining. Let's look at that and let's also look at other areas where we can find and exploit synergies between research and policy. From cloud computing to radio spectrum, 
from rich media to network security. And in fact, later this week, I shall be presenting, and it was already mentioned, our strategy on cloud computing to ensure Europe captures the benefits. And to show we are being absolutely coherent, let's show how different projects are contributing to consistent goals, like how they are benefiting the general public, our economy, our society. For that, we need clear indicators for ICT research and innovation, and a more evidence-based approach to setting priorities and allocating budgets. And I want to propose metrics for this, and I want your views on them. So we shall put them out for comment by stakeholders before the end of the year. And let's have a forum for new open communication between researchers and those they serve. An open, interactive process where innovators can stay in touch with society. Two-way communication. So scientists can show how they are contributing to society and so they can make their research more coherent, more responsible and more relevant to the society's needs. Well, of course, the question is how to do that. Well, we are completely rethinking our approach towards advisory groups. We are strengthening dialogue with a range of actors, from researchers to users, from industry to civil society, and we are getting stakeholders to help us on corporate social responsibility. And I shall be working with my own young advisors, and the youngest at the moment is 16, so I'm proud for it's really young, and they are doing an extremely good job already starters um, with their own businesses and their own inventions and researchers. And of course, uh, beside the young advisors, our new cohort of national digital champions on this. <laughs> Overall, I want us to systematically seek feedback on our initiatives with peer review right from early on in the process. Co-designing, let us check we have the right elements in place and will give us, give us a more solid strategy. Not a bad thing. And that fits in alongside our work on open science with open access to the scientific results from all EU-funded research and progressively opening access to the data too. The third thing we need is research and innovation focused on competitiveness. Remember the time we are in. All of us see slow economic growth. Our young people face worrying job prospects. And our international partners are racing ahead. So figures like in Spain, 52% of the younger generation without a job, and in Greece the same, and a couple of other countries close to that uh, figure, I think it's unacceptable and we should take our actions and we should uh, indeed give them perspective for otherwise we are facing a lost generation. So boosting competitiveness needs to be at the heart of everything we do, including and especially our innovation agenda. For every part of the ICT ecosystem, Let's map out how to achieve global competitive success, and then let's tailor our research to fit that. Here are some ideas in detail. Good research and innovation should eventually translate into real products, real services, and real jobs. But it's not the Commission who will actually take that final step. That is the private sector. So let's get the private sector more involved right from the start. Let's have more of a type of relationship between those researching and those who might invest in their ideas. More private sector financing involved. More business and investment experts involved in selecting and monitoring the projects closer to the market. And of course, more industrial players from across the value chain taking part. And one more thing, ladies and gentlemen, remember, 
what's the real engine of innovation in our 